Um, it's a particular thrill, therefore, to have Pechacucci here tonight, Volume 30 of Pechacucci Edinburgh, uh, a wonderful international organisation. I'm going to hand over to Gordon Duffy, who leads this uh, in Edinburgh for us just shortly. I did want to point out uh, a particular thrill. Tonight we have well, uh, luminary speakers, and I'm very excited to, to hear everyone. Uh, I'm particularly honoured that Richard DeMarco is here with us tonight. Where are you, Richard? Hey, Richard DeMarco. I'd just like to say a word about Richard. Um, some people talk about it, and some people do it. And uh, Richard has led from the front, from the early days in Edinburgh. I've been in early, uh, 30 years. I'm not going to ask Richard how long he's been doing what he's doing. But if you think about the Edinburgh Festival, you can't not but think about Richard DeMarco. So it's a very great privilege to have Richard here tonight, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Uh, very much. I'm going to hand over to Gordon Duffy. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. And I was just going to say first, maybe one or two people who can't really see very much, you could probably sit up. Uh, if you want to move over here, you're more than welcome. I'm going to do that myself. There's a couple of other uh, few seats. So I'll just give you the very, very briefest history of, um, of how this uh, came about. Some of you will probably know. Uh, so this was started um, probably about kind of, uh, where are we, about eight, nine years ago by uh, uh, an architect who was actually in the year um, uh, below me at the Royal College of Art in London. They moved to uh, Tokyo and they, uh, in sort of being enterprising, they also went into property and they, uh, they bought a bar. And then, of course, having bought the bar, I thought, well, how are we going to get people in the bar? And then they thought, I don't know, we'll, have a, we'll get people to talk about what they do, whether they're kind of architects, artists, painters, sculptors, and that will kind of bring uh, you know, some sort of, uh, sort of in crowd into, this, um, into the bar. And then, of course, the next thing, we don't want people to go on and on forever. You know, that, like, especially in the world of ac academia, people can go on for an hour quite easily. And uh, so they came up with this uh, format for 20 images which would roll and uh, they would display for 20 seconds each, which is 6 minutes, 40 seconds, so it keeps it short and concise. And you know, if you don't like one, then there's another one coming along in 6 minutes, 40 seconds. So it makes it sort of short and snappy and uh, you know, a lot of fun. You know, because so each presenter has 20 files and you know, there's, so tonight we've got 8 speakers. Um, we did have 10 and 4 uh, so I pulled out to or uh, went to a hospital. So I'm Gordon Duffy, Studio DUV um, in Edinburgh, and uh, I'm not going to do a presentation, but I've often done them, but this is just kind of a one slide of um, so something we've done. So our first speaker tonight is uh, uh, Marion Priest. Yes. <laughs> by autumn, rain, and wind. I took this photograph when studying landscape architecture in Copenhagen, and one of my professors, who is also an artist, taught, used artworks to talk about spaces, atmospheres, and different textures. And through him, I really started to take a closer look at our immediate surroundings and the forces that intervene, shape, and influence what's happening within, as well as within ourselves. As landscape architect in my co-founded practice, urban pioneer, step pioneer, and as artist myself for you, I try to use these Störkraft or intervening forces that shape and influence the spaces, and also my current emotional states. In my projects, I work with different facets. Sometimes it can be a work as landscape architect, ex-girlfriend, performer, wife or mother, just to name a few. And over the next slides, I will be moving between outdoors, indoors and emotions, collaborating with different situations. Starting with the outdoors, this is a community woodland in Fife and Lochard Spies. And this is over 100 newly planted trees have been planted here close to a residential area. And we put there these elements shaped in oak, beech, and birch leaves because these species 
can be found there, planted there. On one side there are quotes about trees and on the other side you find inscriptions of the Latin and common name of the, the tree species. And amongst the woodland we also um, installed 50 oak plugs, which you'll see in a minute. <laughs> and these are inscribed with tree facts and you can find them hanging on trees, on fences or gates and some are also more humorous and others are more scientific. And working within this woodland, the idea was really to collaborate with the space, with this woodland and to focus um, the thoughts on the woodland. Moving into a um, wide gallery space, which often is seen as a neutral space, this collaboration, when visitors were arriving to the space, you could hear this rhythmic noise going <laughs> and it grew louder and louder upon entering the space, it was almost unbearable and there was I naked on stilts. And this piece was really a respond in response to the space itself, which was mainly min minimalistic and male-dominated artworks exhibited in there, but for me, this was also a very personal art piece because my recent ex-boyfriend back then worked in that building and for me it was really this is who I am and I'm comfortable with who I am. And interestingly as longer people actually stayed in the, in the space they also felt that I was comfortable and they I think enjoyed surprisingly as well staying in there for as long as 20 minutes. Where I actually don't feel feel comfortable sometimes is walking within our streets. Because there are all these railings and barriers and you get told where to go and the desire lines are cut right in front of you because you want to go there and the railing runs right across you. And I just get really pissed off at times. <laughs> so I did the I work with three Edinburgh parkours on this performance called Jump the Barrier. And for the performance, they actually used street furniture, railings and barriers, walls in the West End and used them as their elements, jumped, climbed over them. And really, within this moment, they removed the barrier and really took air and took it down. Yeah, going back to a more natural space again, the outdoors, the woodland. This was actually a Sunday afternoon spent with my husband and two sons as I was invited to participate in a series called Chibo. And this piece, Lupa Capatulina, is based on the Roman foundation myth. And it highlights maternal instinct and also um, really trying to become one with nature and becoming one with the space in this, in this piece. Coming to the last piece I'm talking about, Open Space Advent Calendar, which has been running now for two years and where we invited 24 participants from all over the world hanging the wooden star made by my dad in a public open space. The star has to remain there and in the first year they had to tell us why they chose this public space to put the star up and the second year we asked them to leave a message with the star. And in my projects I really like to use these simpler elements. A star, a wolf must, jumping over a barrier, stilts or simple plaques because they can be reproduced or can be produced or used well, here we have my response to 9-11. I invited 22 artists to consider the um, interface between the culture of Islam and the culture that we're supposed to represent, which is the European dynamic, the christo Judean dynamic, which seems to be at odds with Islam. And so these were all the paintings uh, of how you share you can't help but share your life with Islamic people. I mean, we eat the same fruit, do we not? 
Uh, this is uh, an artwork by one of the Royal Scottish Academicians. I asked all of them to go to the National Gallery of um, uh, the National Museum and choose their favourite images, which were uh, evidence that we had a culture in Europe. At the same time, choose an image which was their favourite idea of Islamic culture. So the two things came together in these new works of art. I mean, there you are. Look, which is Islamic and which is uh, European? And we've, we've all got to imbibe, we've all got to drink, and there you have the coming together of the two, uh, if you like, um, divisive forms of um, expression in terms of visual arts. This is a sundial. There are hundreds of these all over Scotland, and they tell the time in Tehran, in Damascus, and in Edinburgh. And they're designed to do that. And they were part of our 16th, 17th century culture. I think we need more of them now, don't you? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that parliament in Scotland, uh, in Edinburgh, needs a sundial. Anyway, I need artists because without artists, we really are helpless. And who are artists? Well, artists are uh, those designers who aspire to the condition where it's no longer about design, it's about art. This is all inspired by the, the kind of clothes worn by um, Islamic people, uh, people who are tribal. And this is a work by Doug Cocker. I find it very interesting to see how art has given a chance what will respond. As far as I'm concerned, I live in a city that uh, was, oh yes, it's a, that's a peach. <laughs> it's not what you think it is. Uh, it's, it's, it's about how if you have a meal with someone, you're beginning the whole process of communicating with them. There's nothing quite like breaking bread or eating fruit with a fellow human being. So actually, oh that one, yes, uh, the hound. Uh, Afghans love hounds, but we love uh, horse racing and hounds. So think of all the things that bring us together. I would like to think this could be an official end of festival exhibition. Doesn't really matter. I showed it at, in the European Parliament in Brussels. Why not? And um, of course, uh, I mean, acrobats, yes. You'll find that acrobats uh, are also uh, acrobatics. It is part of the culture, cultural heritage of the two ways of living. And here you have, well, bowls, which is, a, a, which is Arabic and which is European. You can't tell, can you? That's the great point. That's the point I'm trying to make with the help of artists. And there's someone there fiddling with a machine. I don't like that. You should look at this. You might learn something. Okay. We are now living in an age where everybody is looking at these damn machines. Uh, I forgot what they're called, the iPads. I don't have one. This, my God, which is, which is the city of Perth there and which is uh, uh, belonging to Tehran? Okay? I love that one. As many images as you can imagine, which are a mixture of uh, Islam and Europe. Now, this is a subject which we should be using instead of the egomania of artists trying to work out some kind of idea of how they're going to win the Turner Prize. I couldn't imagine anybody as daft as that wanting to win something called the Turner Prize, which marks you as someone who wants to be a celebrity or even a multimillionaire. Now here we have, oh my gosh, I'm looking at these and bringing back so many memories and we're having this exhibition, as the main exhibition of an event taking place at Duquerre, and it will be called Beyond Borders, and it's about women in conflict. How do women uh, deal with this? They, they're usually the victims, rather more than the male species of the human condition. And here you have, oh gosh, this, this is the work of a, a fantastic woman, a Scottish artist, and she's using images of peace here. It's clear. You can interpret them yourself. There's no moment for you to look at anything else but these images. 
And, and I represent, uh, uh, how can I say, a, a way of using art as a healing process. The Edna Festival, do you remember? 1947, how many of you were there? Hands up. <laughs> oh God, nobody. And the only human being alive has been to every single Edinburgh Festival. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my job is to say, do you remember why it came into being? Was it to, to fill the coffers of the Edinburgh Council or Edinburgh University who own all the, uh, the, the, these venues? No. The guys who founded it, the guys and girls, thought that after the agony of the Second World War, the human race was suffering mentally, physically, and the only language that could begin the process of healing was the language of art. That's why I waste my time <laughs> uh, trying to persuade people that the language of politics will lead you nowhere, the language of even science will lead you nowhere, because it, it will suggest that there's an answer in scientific terms. There's no answer. The answer is that the artist has a way of surprising us and giving us hope. And I hope you'll turn up at Tequere and you'll be there. Yeah, I think somebody's opening it. I can't believe that. God almighty. Someone called the First Minister. <laughs> and I'll be speaking on the last day, that's on Sunday, uh, with one or two friends on the subject of art as the language of healing, the language of love. Thank you. And it's fantastic uh, uh, spectacle to, to catch it. So, you speak you the anyway, so I recommend you go to this exhibition uh, at the National Gallery in the basement, uh, and you can catch RSA. the RSA. Yes, and you can catch this restored uh, film of Tadeusz Cantor in action at the Edinburgh Festival. So we're going to move on swiftly to our next speaker, Katarina. Where is she? Hi everyone, my name is Kat and I thrive on challenge. So much so in fact that when Gordon asked me if I'd step in for one of the hospitalised people on Tuesday, um, I said yes. Uh, so instead of regurgitating a previous presentation from the last patch which I did in Dundee, I decided to create something from scratch in the last 24 hours. So bear with me. Anyway, um, tonight I'd like to talk about my life's work, literally. Uh, basically my work is attempting to get a life. I may look like a fully functioning member of society, or at least I hope I do, um, but inside I'm basically a dribbling, confused wreck, uh, screaming a silent inner scream. Um, I'm guessing it had something to do with my erratic upbringing, which served me well in some areas of life, um, but in terms of the basics, I really lack some fundamental knowledge as to how to exist on this planet. That basically means I'm a voracious reader of personal development and self-help books, and have been for as long as I can remember. <laughs> Tonight I'd like to give you a brief glimpse into the books which have helped me most in my quest to become a responsible adult in this society. And I really hope that it's of some use to you, I mean particularly those of you who are still struggling to get a life. And for those of you who are already sorted and already have a life, um, I apologise if I bore you. Um, feel free to fall asleep. 
um, but please be quiet for those of us who need to listen. Um, the first book I'd like to talk about is Stephen Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This first came into my life in 2008, and to be honest, I can't really remember much about it, except that he's a Mormon and likes to go to church. I'm not, and I don't. And also that he's really into interdependence, which has got something to do with mutual reliance, as in let's help each other. Um, however, what did stick with me was his method of weekly planning. Basically, instead of scheduling um, your day the night before, uh, you, schedule it, um, you schedule your entire week in one fell swoop, and this is the original template. On the right, you can see mission statement, so you've already sorted that out, you know what you're doing, um, and goals related to different roles which you're playing in life, and all your 8 a.m. appointments. Oh my God. <laughs> Basically, this is my current version of my attempt at Stephen Covey's planning, which completely lacks cohesion and focus. Um, as you can see, it takes me until Thursday to even think about that I might have a priority in life. Um, slightly further down the same day, I realised that my priority is getting a life project, which I kind of knew already. Um, the next book which I thought might change my life was How to Be Brilliant by Michael Heppel. I particularly appreciate the subheading, Change Your Ways in 90 Days, if only. I've lost count of the amount of times I've tried to change my life with this book. Um, the most I managed so far was 10 days before giving up. Um, anyway, what I love about this book, uh, which I still haven't finished because clearly my life would be brilliant by now, is The Wheel of Life, which you can see on the left hand side. Um, that's a sample version of it, and you can break different areas of your life, like how you're doing your money, career, or whatever. The closer you get to the centre in a particular section, the shitter your life is. And <laughs> um, the further out you get, the more brilliant it is. A few months ago, I borrowed this book um, with the firm intention of actually completing the course in 90 days. So I thought of my own wheel of life, um, which I really wanted to show you this evening, but I couldn't find it. But it's actually hiding, I think, in the pile which you can see there, which is the desk of my studio. And I looked for it for about 20 minutes, and I gave up. Um, so instead, I'd like to show you a diagram which is similar, uh, but it's got a completely different intention, which is to categorise beer flavours. But I thought it looked quite similar to that. So clearly my recent attempt to achieve brilliance hasn't really worked out particularly because I've now got a massive library fine um, because I keep forgetting to return the book. <laughs> um, the next book which I thought might help is Zen to Done. That's by Leo Babauta. Um, some of you may know his blog, Zen Habits. Uh, basically, he details how he managed to get a life and his continuing process of getting a life. And I was really inspired by his successes, as in losing weight, giving up smoking, having a million children, and still managing to get some money. Anyway, I thought I'd try out his productivity system. Um, wow. He recommends that you get different notebooks and jot down ideas in them under different headings, one of them being Big Rocks, which is basically your most important priorities or your dreams in this life, and also MITs, which is something to do with what you want to get done this week, or something like that. Anyway, I still haven't worked it out, despite attempting to focus on it since January, but at least I did buy a diary, which you can see on the left-hand side, and I've been using that for the first time in a decade now, so that's pretty good. And I bought two beautiful notebooks to write down the big rocks and MITs in, but I still haven't used them because I haven't understood what big rocks or MITs are yet, so I'm not sure how helpful this book was actually um, to help me get a life. On reflection, the book which has helped me the most in the last few years was Karen Kingston's Clear Your Clutter with Feng Shui, or Feng Shui, I don't actually know how to say it yet. Anyway, jumped off the shelf from Waterstones, straight at me. I took it straight back home and read it from cover to cover that night. It made such an impression on me that I actually trained as a professional clutter clearer with Karen Kingston. It took me five years, and I qualified at the beginning of this year. For those who aren't familiar with the term clutter, it's basically anything that you do not use or love. Um, untidy or dis disorganized things, or too many things in a small space, or anything unfinished. <laughs> um, since systematically clearing my clutter, um, I found that it's simply been the most revolutionary act of my life so far. Um, however, as the physical detritus falls away, it's become clearer and clearer that I've still got shitloads of emotional and psychological clutter, which I haven't wanted to look at up until now. Um, so my latest attempt to get to life is applying the principle of hormesis, H-O-R-N-E-S-I-S, to curing my eyesight. I'm not exactly sure what it is. I just know that it involves training your eyes to thrive on stress, and it's possible to reverse short-sightedness, those are my short-sighted glasses on the left, um, by wearing long-sighted glasses, those are long-sighted glasses on the right. 
Okay. Which force your eyes to work harder, see normally again. <coughs> anyway, I've managed to reduce my prescription, and I hope to go to see 2020 before I'm dead. Um, part of the reason I so badly want to get to life is so that I can help other people get to life. I'm not sure how useful the insights have been for you this evening, which I've shared with you. I mean, telling you that I got the diary and that it worked is probably not really revolutionary stuff for you guys. Um, but maybe we don't necessarily have to aim to be brilliant in 90 days. <coughs> Maybe it's okay just to take tragically small, simple steps towards getting a life, and that those somehow make a difference. I'm not sure. I haven't worked it out yet. Like Richard, I have no answer, basically. I don't know what it is. My quest continues. Um, for those of you who fell asleep, thanks for being quiet. I'm looking for a new studio. Please contact me if you want to. <laughs> thanks very much.
to Kant here, and I was interested in this idea of uh, people talking over one another, like uh, often happens with politicians on debates where you speak over one another. And uh, so I've got these two cans, and there's little speakers attached to the back of each can. And out of one can, there's Nigel Thrash, and out of the other can, there's Nick Clegg, and they're both speaking about immigration. And their voices kind of overlap, and you can't make sense of them. Well, you can't make sense of them individually, but especially <laughs> not together. And, uh, and here at the front, there's a, a little sensor, so if you walk away from the machine, the audio, the volume of the audio dies down, and then it becomes perfectly silent. And if you approach the machine, uh, the volume increases, and you can hear them speaking. Uh, this is it installed in uh, Dundee Contemporary Art Centre, where it was shown last year uh, as part of an exhibition called Decision Time, which was around the time of the uh, independence referendum. So, the last piece is uh, a collaborative piece, which is called the Automated Porsche Machine. Um, so, this uh, I worked with a poet called Michael Peterson, and he's an Edinburgh based poet. And this machine, you're invited to swipe your bank card. And once you swipe your bank card, you're then asked to dial a number on this dial. And then, based on data from your bank card and this one number, the machine selects and arranges lines of poetry. So Michael wrote about a couple of dozen uh, lines of poetry that would uh, work and fit together in different ways. So when the machine uh, generates this poem, then uh, this bespoke poem is printed beneath the machine, and then you can rip it off and take it away. And then also, uh, while it's printing, it plays a little tune and the, the melody is unique to your bank card, so <laughs> each person has this own little uh, melody that plays. And this is at uh, an event at the Fruit Market Gallery. So it was interested in ideas around sort of commerce and culture, but also this idea of uh, whether people would trust to use the machine in case I was taking their data, <laughs> which I wasn't. <laughs> And finally, I just thought I'd finish on this quickly, which is a new piece I'm working on, uh, which is a large-scale installation, which I hope to show soon, which again looks at ideas around uh, privacy and, uh, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Just before we start, uh, just before we start, uh, Richard's just going to say a couple of a uh, couple of words about two pieces of uh, work he's brought with him on this theme of continued theme of collaboration and culture. Well, I, I don't suppose anyone it doesn't know that Joseph Beuys was the co-founder of the Green Party in Germany and that his greatest work of art was uh, the planting of 7,000 oak trees in that, uh, how can I say, uh, Holy of Holies documenta, where every artist wants to be. He planted 7,000 oaks, um, and with the oak, because you realize the oak is the druidic, um, sacred number, seven. Normally they're planted in groups of seven. You've got seven oaks and uh, Dumbarton oaks and all over the place. Um, and the Celtic world in Ireland and in Scotland reveres the planting of oaks because the oak is the king of the forest. And he said to me, I want to speak to you about the last work that I will do, which is the planting of 7,000 oak trees together with 7,000 basaltic stones. So when the oak dies after 700 years, or is in the process of dying, the stone will remain. So the next step is to 
is to plant another oak. And this is for me the greatest work of art of the 20th century. 7,000 icon uh, oaks. Here he is, um, part of a, a conference I attended. Art meets science and spirituality in a changing economy and he's speaking to the Dalai Lama and he's considering his own work in relation to Rembrandt, to Mondrian and to Rauschenberg. And he's asking profound questions such as the ones you're asking here today. I wanted you to see that because one of the other things I did was move my gallery to a farm building next door to a rather large nuclear power station um, in East Lothian. And that power station, this is a drawing I did, is uh, about uh, bringing the work of nine Nobel Prize winning uh, scientists, physicists, uh, and their work at CERN into uh, the realm of the Scottish art world. Because the real problem that Boyce gave me was they said either we develop more and more nuclear power stations or we consider alternative technology. That's the question. Not about whether artists end up winning uh, some kind of prize at the Edinburgh Festival, five stars or eight stars or nine stars. For 45 festivals, there was no such thing as a prize, either on the films, films section of it, or anywhere. And I think what we've really got to do is keep our minds on the major issues. I'm so glad that you mentioned Cantor's film. That film is all about the world of refugees. Every human being just inches away from playing the role of a refugee. You'll see that in that film, magnificently expressed. And where did it take place? It took place in my favorite gallery of all time. I've never had a gallery in Edinburgh. I've always had to move from one place to the other. And thank God uh, I have friends here who helped me uh, for a while move into uh, a church which are holes in the roof and dead cats. Uh, it was, um, but the, my favorite place was called the Poor House, and it was owned by a strange organization called Edinburgh University, and that Poor House was the place where I put Boyce and Cantor and Buckminster Fuller, and all the people asking the serious questions of our time, the serious questions which will never be answered by politicians when they get together. They can only be answered by artists. And so I'm so delighted to be here tonight, and I want to thank Gordon and everyone who's actually asked me. I'm here to tell you that you're on a very difficult road, and here am I, aged 85, even older than Jim Hayes, <coughs> sitting there, aged 81, I can't believe that. And you can't, you can't say, I'm going to end, I'm going to stop, because the work you've got to do as artists is to stop the nonsense that the art world belongs to the world of entertainment, because that's where it is now, the world of Oscars and Hollywood and, and all, all that rubbish. It's the world and the knife edge of our capacity to survive. And I'm so glad there's someone here who uh, took the trouble to get to Greenham Common. And uh, you realize, of course, that artists are not really serious people. <laughs> the whole bunch of them. And they're, they're, they're sort of given handouts of money uh, so that uh, maybe it will keep them happy so they can have another exhibition or something and they can end up in the teeth. It's nonsense. The language of art is the only language which transforms our lives for the better. It's the only language which we can use for survival. Every time I see a, a, a private view with people drinking wine, turning their backs on whatever the art is, I think maybe it's because the art is of any special value. <laughs> and I'm thinking that maybe in a space like this, which reminds me of the poor house, my God, what a poor house this is, falling apart. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, it's beautiful. 
I, I, everything about it is about the passing of time. It's a workshop. It's where people worked. And in a way, it becomes beautiful because of the honest labor that took place here. And I'm thinking, what are we doing considering building yet another version of the, the fruit market for millions? I, I remember the day when it was a fruit market. Remember the smell, that beautiful smell of fruit? I remember the day when people went talking in millions of uh, whatever it is we have to pay for art institutions. I'm against that, okay? I'm against the whole idea that the artist is reduced as a kind of entertainer. Art is the most serious language we have. And when we use it wrongly, we pollute society. We pollute our world. And so I'm so happy to be here. I love what all the speakers said. Uh, I might not be able to stay to the end, but I've got a funny feeling that Jim is going to say something about the Edinburgh that he found uh, in the 50s. 50s? My God, I met Jim in 1957. He was so young. <laughs> <laughs> and he smelt of the kind of perfume that the male uh, American <coughs> servicemen wore. I think it was called Old Spice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he had a button down shirt. Button down shirt? I'd never had anything like that. And his shirt was made of Oxford cloth. He came from a superior culture, from the, the world of the Americans who were saving the world with their use of nuclear weaponry. <laughs> and his job was to be on board, helping them provide us with this nonsense. But now he's um, converted and has become a member of the human race. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's actually what art does. I just love the idea uh, that you've got to help nuclear physicists. Uh, and the only way you can help them is get them to consider using the language of creativity. Which means not that you've got uh, all the uh, technolo technological uh, equipment that you need to invent something very special. It means that you've got the power of the artists, the two artists, to create something necessary for the human race to survive. I'm looking forward to what Jim is liable to say. It's probably going to be terrifyingly thought-provoking and at the same time very humorous because one of his great weapons was to <coughs> prove that if you want to tell the truth about art, uh, think of how it can be used in a way that Shakespeare used it, or the great artists that we follow. We follow up at our peril if we don't use the same intentions that they had. So here we are. This was a barn, no light, no heating, and it was usually filled with vegetables. That's where my archive was. And next door was the nuclear power station. And what did I do? I connected this power station with CERN, where the whole world is waiting for that nuclear, whatever it is, that thing, to tell us uh, the truth of the Big Bang. The Big Bang is about the time. The moment that time began for all of us. And I asked the question, why are we spending millions on recreating the Big Bang when we fail to use the money which the artist would use most effectively in the process of healing. Thank you. Well, thank you, Richard. So, uh, without further ado, we're going to start the second half with an artist. Hey. <laughs> So if you can give uh, if you can give each speaker a sort of uh, rising welcome and a sort of rising send off. Thank you very much, Paulina Sandberg. Hi. Um, so uh, six 
up collaborations from the last uh, decade or so that I work on. Uh, the first one, number one, Out of Order, uh, Art College here in Edinburgh. We were a group of artists who set up installations outside of college. And for this event, we moved out into the Cowgate, uh, Edinburgh's own street from the underworld, for a very temporary exhibition on a Friday night. There was a sound piece by Ron Clark, <coughs> a performance with wheat flour by Erika Stanga, and two light boxes which I'd made. To give you an idea of the atmosphere surrounding us on a Friday night, here's with the words of Andy Brown, musician and poet. Edinburgh in the night, Bacardi breeze a witch fight. <laughs> Edinburgh in the night, guilt and sin and stag night. Edinburgh in the night, broken black cloth bottled street fight. Number two, Echo, a collaborative I set up with Tonya McMullen seven years ago. Together we organized exhibitions and interventions and events in Scotland and Sweden and made some collaborative pieces too. This was the first one, starting point, in a hotel, in a room in a hotel, where we took the things you would find in the hotel and uh, used them for installations and performance. Um, here we have the cracker bread bed, which people could lie down on. Um, it was based on the Swedish custom to put crumbs from cracker bread in the bed of the newlywed couple for the wedding night. We also asked performance poet J.L. Williams to collaborate with us on a phone piece, where the phone would ring in the room and anyone who answered would get um, live poetry read by Jennifer uh, in another place in the hotel. And Japanese artist Takahiro Masaki created this miniature landscape in the bathroom. Our motto for Echo was to use in-between spaces and unseen locations to present a smorgasbord of contemporary art. The biggest exhibition we did was at St. Margaret's House in Edinburgh, which was then just about to be turned into the art complex. Ten artists from Glasgow and ten from Edinburgh. Uh, set up installation in this huge disused office building where mainly pigeons seem to have lived for a very long time. <laughs> and then we took this hotel room intervention idea to an art fair in su uh, called Supermarket in Stockholm um, where we also brought over um, sculptures, uh, Katie Orton's sculpture in the background, mm -hmm. and Jim from Moon's breathing mount on the bed. Number three, privacy. Um, at ECA, I caught the tail end of a research project called Protocademy. I got involved in this project that they were developing with a German artist called Olaf Nikolai, uh, looking at privacy as a subject and identifying it as an area of collaborative research. So the event that I helped organizing was in a bird watching hive at Duddingston Loch where I had made recordings of friends telling me stories about meeting wild animals and you could listen to them <coughs> inside this hive. Um, there was also um, a second part to this event was on Blackford Hill at the Old Observatory uh, with some talks about the solar system and about the Renaissance Memory Theatre and we could watch the sun and its sunspots, you can just about maybe see them, um, through this telescope. This whole program of events was spread over a week's time in Edinburgh um, and it was called Privacy, a program of symposia. And David Thorpe wrote in this publication afterwards about how artists have begun a new engagement with wider society, adopting practices whose outputs are often difficult to define. <laughs> give and take, looking at exchange and influence as part of the creative process. Ten artists were paired off and asked to give each other instructions to make new work. And I was invited and amongst the instructions I got was to read Ratner's Star by Don DeLillo and to find the title from it, uh, to title for my book in the book. And I made this whole series of pencil drawings uh, influenced by this book and got the title We Are Part Star, You and I from it. And looking, for, looking at it now, I realised that these instructions and the other instructions have really influenced my work. 
uh, much more than I thought at the time. So this is number five, post office drawings, a drawing game that I set up in 2010. Uh, five drawings worked on by five participants in five countries uh, and then sent in between everyone, so everyone got to work on each drawing. The drawing, this was drawing number three, used scissors, mm. knife and glue. And here's drawing number five, used edible materials. And the materials that got used was tomato puree, soy sauce, beetroot, coffee and blueberry jam. It wasn't a complete success, because two out of five of the drawings got lost in the post. So this is number six, and the most recent collaboration from June this year, um, Drawing on Performance. A performance event in three parts with participatory elements created by Naomi Garriok and Pavina Sandberg. We are subverting the usual form and etiquette of the live drawing class with a durational performance. The audience will be divided into exhibitionists, voyeurs, and anti-participatory, depending on their preference. We are looking forward to seeing you, charcoal in hand. So there are three parts to this. The revelation, the draped life, which is fun, and the screen. So it has a format of a light drawing class, but kind of put on its head and uh, um, presented as this uh, performance piece where the audience were invited to either model, draw, or just observe. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Paulina. And our, our moving <coughs> swiftly on, our next speaker is uh, David Seal. Okay, um, apologies, there's not going to be so many gorgeous images. I'm not an artist, I'm an architect. Um, and I wanted to really just think about how collaboration works, particularly from my view as somebody who works in building trade um, and still is trying to be a creative. And so I thought I'd put up two different images there. One was Jeff Coons, where we've got lots of people working for him. The other one is Assemble, who were put up for the Turner Prize, but I think they were very surprised about it, <laughs> who just work collaboratively with each other. I thought I'd compare it to another example of people working collaboratively, which is a band. Um, in this case, obviously, the Smiths, who uh, about at that point thought everything was going equally, but then they signed a contract where Morrissey and Mar got 40% each and Rourke and Joyce got 10% and ended up in court, so that was more the actual relationship between them. But still managed to produce a lot more together than they did individually, and I think if you go back to it and listen, the, the guys who were the parts, as it said in the court, um, produced an awful lot to it. I'm a member of CEDA, the Scottish Ecological Design Association, and we try to be collaborative. We are individuals, we do our own thing, um, various different architects mostly, but we work together to promote ecological design. And one thing we're interested in is how to build collaboratively. It's quite a lot of us work with community groups, but equally work out how to get people together to get involved in design. So here's an example of how it could work. You've got three different people who have all spotted uh, somewhere they'd like to live but can't afford to do it, have got their own ideas of what they'd like to put in there. Miraculously, in this case, they all fit together. Um, and there is a model of this, how this can work, that's running in Europe as we speak. Um, the interesting thing, of course, is they have to bring somebody in 99% in of the time to tell them how to do this. And suddenly that dynamic changes, that who's in charge here? Is it the expert or isn't it? And in this particular case, if I'm saying that second position there can be particularly crucial, where if there's a group of people who are trying to get a project going together collaboratively, if they take charge of it, they buy the site, then suddenly the influence of the expert shrinks. Um, at the end of the day, the interesting thing, of course, is they are the experts in how to use this place. And why would you give over all that power to somebody else while you're making it? Um, because it's difficult is the answer. But there, you go. there is something in Germany, particularly in Austria and France and various other places, called a Baukorpe, or a Baugemeinschaft build group, in other words. And it is now formalized, and it's producing thousands of buildings. Here's an example of one that's from Berlin, um, where what you can see is maybe a sort of 
It's one where the architect took the leap and moved into one of the uh, offices, and you can look at the bulk plans, they're all different. And you'll never get something like that from a developer. You know, you'll get a chance to choose the colour. Here's something that you may have heard of, it's co-housing. This is fairly recent in London. Um, again, with an architect on board, in this case, the people found the site first and then interviewed architects and brought them in. I think you can spot some similarities between them, that they're kind of flexible and fairly neutral. So I think this whole process brings on different things. And I think the Tinker bike at the back there is a similar comparison, that it's something fairly neutral that you can fit something in, but then there's something very individual about it, because each one's different. Anyway, that doesn't get to the enough of how do you build to get the collaboratively. And here's something that CEDA are doing, the CEDA Build School. Um, it's currently based in Milton, in North Glasgow, and it's holding a series of courses um, through the year. It's come to the end of its first phase now. We've got some funding to do this, to get the materials, and to bring certain bits of expertise. But essentially, it's taking people who are locally who have no idea how to build things. They haven't got anything out there on their uh, estates that they can actually use. So rather than just going and apply for money, they get small amounts. Seed brings in the expertise. We hold a course. The locals get it for free. And the people who come from further fields, maybe they might be architects, they might be builders, to learn how to build green, they pay for it and subsidize the other guys. And so far they've built things like outdoor school rooms, um, can be something fairly prosaic for the garden. They'd love to build their own community centre, but they're having real problems with Glasgow Council. We won't sell them land for anything less than exorbitant, even though it's in Milton, which is nobody wants to build there, apart from them. So what we're planning to do now is to take this to other places around the country and do a similar model and find other communities that we want to work with. So it's that idea of producing something that's marked by the people who are going to use it at the end of the day. Um, and what we want to do that is coming to Edinburgh as part of next year's um, festival of the National Year of uh, Scottish Year of Architecture, Design and Innovation. It's not one of these grand Scottish things like we see as Year of Food. Um, see, it's got a small amount of money to do that, and part of that is going to be bringing the Build School to Edinburgh. We're going to try and find a local community, and work a series of courses, and then give them something at the end of the day that they've helped build. Um, this is the programme that we put together for the whole of the year, and this is going to be going on in various different places around Scotland, each of the big cities. We're going to be doing bike tours. We're going to be doing special publications. This is a publication we had at the end of last year about community groups, which I, I sort of helped put together. And the special thing that we're doing for Edinburgh, this is our Shane's plug coming up, is the Festival of Green Drinks. So we hold regular events, a bit like this, where we get somebody to talk about um, an issue related to ecological design. But the idea is it ends pretty quickly and then everybody carries on drinking and you can talk to each other and you can talk to the speaker. Um, we're going to try and do a whole month of them in May next year, including hopefully the launch of the Bothy that the Build School have done. We're going to do talks about a bit like you're holding from here, walking around the town, looking at particular things again to do with the um, innovations in housing and particular things about co-housing. We want to bring one of those guys up from London to talk about it. And if you want to get involved in that, if any of this sounds interesting, if you want to get in collaborating with CEDA, because we like to get in touch with other people, we want you to do what alternates say, which is don't wait me wait, collaborate. <laughs> Thank you. That's the chief. Oh. Oh.
Um, for the past years of my studies, I started using myself as a model in my work. First in my drawings and paintings, and later on in my photographs and videos. So, these pictures, there are some portraits, but they're a bit qualified in Photoshop, because I actually don't have a leg as long as this one. <laughs> but I, I chose to, I don't need my neck, because my friends, even my tutors, were always telling me that I look like a giraffe. Like <laughs> even like Roadrunner, and I thought uh, it would be interesting and amusing at the same time to show them how I would really look like if I had. <laughs> so that's how this series, which I named Self Portrait with Long Neck, uh, started. And uh, <coughs> this was actually the starting point of my next project, which you're going to see in a second. Uh, called Yo, which means me in Romanian. Um, two seconds. <laughs> so, yeah, it's called Yo, which means me in Romanian. And it has nothing to do with European Union, although they're still the same. <laughs> so, because I thought I, I haven't explored enough this idea of distorted self portraits, I decided to continue in the same direction. Um, mm. So I tried to represent myself in these pictures as a bizarre character that takes many unusual forms. Um, this project was <coughs> actually my dissertation project, which was uh, also for which I got the award, the mm -hmm. university prize for the best project in my department. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm going to speak a little bit about how I, about the process, how I took the pictures. Uh, the first step was to <coughs> set up a small studio. Beautiful. I got a digital camera, a tripod, some lights, some props, like I don't know, a curtain, a chair, very basic stuff, some shoes. And I started having fun on my own for a couple of nights. <laughs> um, the next step was to the, the editing, for which I used Photoshop. Um, I, for these images, I didn't really use it to modify the, to modify the shape of my body or these feet are... This is actually a really good I was... It looks like I have my knees bent, but mm. they're not. So that's why it looks like I have big feet. Mm. What else? Mm. I think, no. Here is the same one. I didn't use, uh, use it to uh, erase my legs. I was just hiding them behind my winter scarf. Um, I use it in Photoshop. I use it for um, desaturating the colors and applying this fuzzy filter, graining filter. Here, I guess you can notice I, I used it a bit on my third hand. Um, because I wanted to um, make this weird universe look more convincing, I chose two of my photographs, after I, which I did two videos. So this is one of them. This picture, here I had two pairs of the same shoes. I put some socks into them and then photoshop them to the skin. And then the video, which should be the video. I <clears throat> wanted to show a little bit of um, the, let's say, private life, but she just came home from a long walk and she's mm -hmm. just relaxing her, for tired legs. Um, This is how it looked before, before the editing. Um, and you'll see the secret behind, behind the 
the same picture I chose to make a video after. Um, for this, uh, for this one, a friend of mine helped me. Like she was just holding my hair, and after that, I erased it in Photoshop. I didn't use too much hairspray. <laughs> <laughs>
a nude model was wheeled across the organ gallery. Uh, if you were in the audience, you saw it as a blur. It, it, you practically, did I really see this? <laughs> but of course, all the Sunday Record and Daily Express and Sunday Mail went behind and took photographs of her. This is a uh, Saint. Uh, this is James Court. Uh, the site of the first Travis Theater uh, belonged uh, to uh, our dear late lamented friend Tom Mitchell. Uh, this is London. I was one of the people who started a newspaper called International Times. The Times sued us and made us drop the name International Times, so it became IT. It. And uh, well, we they didn't sue us; they threatened to sue us. Um, it was a newspaper in order to um, in order to create event and to publicize our, that was, that's the first first issue, which was, uh, I sold, I was the first street seller of IT. I stood in front of the Baldwin <laughs> as they came out of the Peter Brook production of U.S. selling the paper. Uh, Charles Marowitz reviewed it in the first issue. What's this? That's the end of the art slam. <laughs> the end of the art slam, okay. Ah. <laughs> it ended, all things end, things change, one moves on. I started a newspaper in Amsterdam with several friends, including the famous uh, Jermaine Greer. And uh, we, it was a sexual freedom newspaper. And we, there's the issue number one, suck. <laughs> and uh, it, caused, uh, it actually opened amazing doors. Salvador Dali and I became great friends because he loved the newspaper. <laughs> so it was, opened a lot of doors. Uh, what happened? Oh, Scotland Yard tried, came to Amsterdam to, uh, tried to bring a case against us. Uh, we created a film festival called the Wet Dream Film Festival, which was to try to make a festival which uh, uh, showed erotic cinema. I like erotic things. and I'm not very much interested in pornography, but I do like erotica. There's a subtle difference. If, 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 you know, everyone has their own definition of erotica. This is a production that was in Edinburgh a couple of years ago at the festival called Casablanca, and I took it to Paris. And it's Kevin Mitchell, who had played Humphrey Bogart in the production. And we had a modest success in Paris, and now I'm negotiating with four theaters in New York to produce it in New York in next spring, I hope. And that's me in Paris, my house in Paris, where I've lived for 45 years, I think. And every Sunday I have a dinner, which the world is invited to. If you want to come, just Google my name and send me an email message. I prefer email to telephone. Uh, and send me a message and come, come and come and die. 150,000 people have died and so forth. Oh, this is an ad that was on British and Irish television. Now I throw an open dinner party each week and around 70 strangers show up, although we do get the odd regular. People always ask how I get rid of everyone at the end of the night. The truth is, I've never been very good at that. <laughs> Year after I paid it, thirty thousand dollars, thirty thousand euros for that. <laughs> Thank you very much, and come to dinner. Thank you all for coming, and if you want to, uh, we've, we've actually got, we've got the next two events are already planned. We've got uh, there's the City Link Festival in, in September, where we're sort of taking part in that. I've uh, got a very small venue with probably 40 people, uh, and then the, the next one after that we're doing Napier University. So uh, I'd love to thank you for coming, and uh, if you um, uh, you know if you if you want to sort of get involved, go onto the website and you can send me an email. If you're interested in presenting or you know somebody who would be very good at presenting or has got something to say, mm -hmm. that would be great. So I'm, I'm Gordon Duffy, Studio DV, lovely to see you all. And maybe I'd like maybe John to say a final word of uh, good night. Sir. Well, I'm almost speechless. Uh, um, our summer program we call the Art and Design and Collaboration. I'm humbled by the turnout tonight and in particular by speakers, so um, I'd like to thank Gordon for bringing Petra to Gay for the Creative Spaces 
and I think I just want to say thank you very much to uh, the speakers tonight. It's been a complete privilege. Thank you very much.